Section 16 of Great Ghost Stories by Joseph Lewis French. Section 16 Green Branches, Part 1 by Fiona MacLeod. In the year that followed the death of Manus Macadron, James Achena saw nothing of his brother Gloom. He might have thought himself alone in the world of all his people but for a letter that came to him out of the west true he had never accepted the common opinion that his brothers had both been drowned on the night when annie gillespie left islandmore with manus in the first place he had nothing of that inner conviction concerning the fate of gloom which he had concerning that of marcus in the next had he not heard the sound of the fadden, which no one that he knew played except Gloom, and, for further token, was not the tune that which he hated above all others, the dance of the dead, for who but Gloom would be playing that, he hating it so, and the hour being late and no one else on Islandmore. It was no sure thing that the dead had not come back, but the more he thought of it, the more Achana believed that his sixth brother was still alive. Of this, however, he said nothing to any one. It was as a man set free that, at last, after long waiting and patient trouble, with the disposal of all that was left of the Achana heritage, he left the island. It was a grey memory for him, the bleak moorland of it, the blight that had lain so long and so often upon the crops the rains that had swept the isle for grey days and grey weeks and grey months the sobbing of the sea by day and its dark moan by night its dim relinquishing sigh in the calm of dreary ebbs its hollow baffling roar when the storm shadow swept up out of the sea one and all oppressed him even in memory he had never loved the island even when it lay green and fragrant in the green and white seas under white and blue skies fresh and sweet as an eden of the sea he had ever been lonely and weary tired of the mysterious shadow that lay upon his folk caring little for any of his brothers except the eldest long since mysteriously gone out of the ken of man and almost hating gloom who had ever borne him a grudge because of his beauty and because of his likeness to and reverent heed for alison moreover ever since he had come to love katrine macarthur the daughter of donald macarthur who lived in sleet of sky he had been eager to live near her the more eager as he knew that gloom loved the girl also and wished for success not only for his sake but so as to put a slight upon his younger brother so when at last he left the island he sailed southward gladly he was leaving islandmore he was bound to a new home in sky and perhaps he was going to his long-delayed, long-dreamed-of happiness. True, Katrine was not pledged to him. He did not even know for sure if she loved him. He thought, hoped, dreamed, almost believed that she did. But then there was her cousin Ian, who had long wooed her, and to whom old Donald MacArthur had given his blessing. Nevertheless, his heart would have been lighter than it had been for long, but for two things. First, there was the letter. Some weeks earlier he had received it, not recognizing the writing, because of the few letters he had ever seen, and, moreover, as it was in a feigned hand. With difficulty he had deciphered the manuscript, plain printed though it was. It ran thus well seamus my brother it is wondering if i am dead you will be maybe i and maybe no 
but I send you this writing to let you know that I know all you do and think of. So, you are going to leave Island Moor without an Akana upon it? And you will be going to Sleet in Sky? Well, let me be telling you this thing. Do not go. I see blood there, and there is this too. Neither you nor any man shall take Katrine away from me. You know that, and Ian MacArthur knows it, and Katrine knows it, and that holds whether I am alive or dead. I say to you, do not go. It will be better for you and for all. Ian MacArthur is away in the North Sea with the whaler captain who came to us at Islandmore and will not be back for three months yet. It will be better for him not to come back, but if he comes back, he will have to reckon with the man who says that Katrine MacArthur is his. I would rather not have two men to speak to, and one my brother. It does not matter to you where I am. I want no money just now. But put aside my portion for me. Have it ready for me against the day I call for it. I will not be patient that day, so have it ready for me. In the place that I am, I am content. You will be saying, why is my brother away in a remote place? I will say this to you, that it is not further north than St. Kilda, nor further south than the Mull of Cantyre. And for what reason? That is between me and silence. But perhaps you think of Anne sometimes. Do you know that she lies under the green grass? And of Manus Macadrum? They say that he swam out into the sea and was drowned, and they whisper of the seal blood, though the minister is wrath with them for that. He calls it a madness. Well, I was there at that madness, and I played to it on my fodden. And now, Seamus, can you be thinking of what the tune was that I played? Your brother who waits his own day, gloom. Do not be forgetting this thing. I would rather not be playing the Dam San Amire. It was an ill hour for Manus when he heard the Dan Anron. It was the song of his soul that, and yours is the Dav San Amerv. This letter was ever in his mind. This and what happened in the gloaming when he sailed away for Skye in the herring smack of two men who lived at Armandale in Sleet. For, as the boat moved slowly out of the haven, one of the men asked him if he was sure that no one was left upon the island, for he thought he had seen a figure on the rocks waving a black scarf. Akana shook his head, but just then his companion cried that at that moment he had seen the same thing. So the smack was put about, and when she was moving slowly through the haven again, Akana sculled ashore in the little cogly punt. In vain he searched here and there, calling loudly again and again. Both men could hardly have been mistaken, he thought. If there were no human creature on the island, and if their eyes had not played them false, who could it be? The wraith of Marcus, mayhap. Or might it be the old man himself, his father, risen to bid farewell to his youngest son, or to warn him? It was no use to wait longer, so, looking often behind him, he made his way to the boat again and rowed slowly out toward the smack. Jerk, 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 across the water came, low but only too loud for him, the opening motif of the Damsa Namira. A horror came upon him, and he drove the boat through the water so that the sea splashed over the bows. 
when he came on deck he cried in a hoarse voice to the man next to him to put up the helm and let the smack swing to the wind there is no one there callum campbell he whispered and who is it that will be making that strange music what music sure it has stopped now but i heard it clear and so did andre McEwen. it was like the sound of a reed pipe and the tune was an eerie one at that it was the dance of the dead and who will be playing that asked the man with fear in his eyes no living man no living man no i'm thinking it will be one of my brothers who was drowned there and by the same token that it is gloom for he played upon the fodden but if not then then the two men waited in breathless silence, each trembling with superstitious fear. But at last the elder made a sign to Akana to finish. Then it will be the Kelpie. Is there, is there one of the cave women here? It is said, and you know of old that the Kelpie sings or plays a strange tune to wild seamen to their death. At that moment the fantastic jerking music came loud and clear across the bay. There was a horrible suggestion in it, as if dead bodies were moving along the ground with long jerks and crying and laughing wild. It was enough. The men— Campbell and McEwen would not now have waited longer if Akana had offered them all he had in the world, nor were they or he out of their panic haste till the smack stood well out at sea and not a sound could be heard from Islandmore. They stood watching silent out of the dusky mass that lay in the seaward way to the north came a red gleam. It was like an eye staring after them with blood-red glances. What is that, Akana? It looks as though a fire had been lighted in the house up in the island. The door and the window must be open. The fire must be fed with wood, for no peats would give that flame. And there were none lighted when I left. To my knowing, there was no wood for burning— except the wood of the shelves and the bed. And who would be doing that? I know of that no more than you do, Callum Campbell. No more was said, and it was a relief to all when the last glimmer of the light was absorbed in the darkness. At the end of the voyage, Campbell and McEwen were well pleased to be quit of their companion not so much because he was moody and distraught as because they feared that a spell was upon him a fate in the working of which they might become involved it needed no vow of the one to the other for them to come to the conclusion that they would never land on island more or if need be only in broad daylight and never alone the days went well for james Akana where he made his home at ranza beg on ranza water in the sleet of sky the farm was small but good and he hoped that with help and care he would soon have the place as good a farm as there was in all sky donald macarthur did not let him see much of katrine but the old man was no longer opposed to him Seamus must wait till Ian MacArthur came back again, which might be any day now. For sure, James Akina of Ranza Beg was a very different person from the youngest of the Akina folk, who held by on lonely island moor. Moreover, the old man could not but think with pleasure that it would be well to see Katrine able to walk over the whole land of Ranza 
from the cairn at the north of his own Ronzamore to the burn at the south of Ronzabeg, and know it for her own. But Achina was ready to wait. Even before he had the secret word of Katrine, he knew from her beautiful dark eyes that she loved him. As the weeks went by, they managed to meet often, and at last Katrine told him that she loved him too, and would have none but him, but that they must wait till Ian came back because of the pledge given to him by her father. They were days of joy for him, though many a hot noontide hour, through many a gloaming he went as one in a dream. Whenever he saw a birch swaying in the wind, or a wave leaping upon Loch Lath that was near his home, or passed a bush covered with wild roses, or saw the moonbeams lying white on the boles of the pines, he thought of Katrine. His fawn for grace, and so lithe and tall, with sun-brown face and wavy dark mass of hair, and shadowy eyes and rowan red lips. It is said that there is a god clothed in shadow who goes to and fro among the humankind, putting silence between lovers with his waving hands, and breathing a chill out of his cold breath, and leaving a gulf of deep water flowing between them because of the passing of his feet. That shadow never came their way. Their love grew as a flower, fed by rains and warmed by sunlight. When midsummer came, and there was no sign of Ian MacArthur, it was already too late. Katrine had been won. End of Section 16 Green Branches Part 1please subscribe to update new videos. Please share and like if you enjoyed the video thanks so much.